This presentation is all about Johan. Johan, Johan is the word which um, in Japanese means changed by fire. And primarily it's used to refer to the various techniques that you find on your pieces as you pull them out, all the different effects that you get from the wood firing that is usually referred to as Johan. And traditionally, there were about 12 or 15 of them described specifically related to Bizen firing in, uh, in, in Imbe, Japan, the Bizen area, the Bizen style of wood firing. They had um, a whole set of categories of Johan that they spoke about. And with the writing of our book, we upped that number to somewhere around 35, 40 different effects that I'll talk about here and that you can see fully displayed and discussed in the book, I believe in chapter two. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And I also want to add an additional concept. So Johan, um, the fire changes, they occur during the firing for a lot of reasons. Um, we divide them in, um, to effects from ash deposit, the actual physical landing and, and melting of ash on your piece, and through volatized material carried in the flame. The chemistry of ash um, is that it is composed of calcium, potassium, and sodium primarily, mostly calcium, with just traces of iron and even less of manganese and perhaps a little bit of something like titanium or something like that. So those are the actual chemicals that are in wood ash that are responsible for the surfaces, textures, colors on your pieces. Um, calcium, potassium, and sodium all are fluxes, which means their role is to cause silica to turn to glass. And of course, um, melting silica, all the, all the clay is almost primarily, it's almost 100%, well, it's a, a large part silica. So the ash hits the clay and melts it and turns it to glass. And so that's what's happening. Now, all those materials to some degree volatize. And what that means is when the kiln gets really, really hot, when it starts to get into the 21, 22, 2300 degrees, the, all those chemicals, the calcium, potassium, sodium, iron, they all begin to some degree to volatize, meaning going from solid to gaseous state, and they're carried in the flame. And that gives you a whole different set of effects that we'll look at here. A third category that I like to think about and talk about is that um, the, the ceramic pieces are not the only things changed by fire, that speaking metaphorically, thinking that things poetically, that all of us get um, an experience together working towards a common goal. And this effect uh, effectively gives us a change, gives us an experience to remember, and gives us an opportunity to work well together, perhaps make friends, and learn a lot about each other. And here you can see um, just a feeling of uh, firing the kiln. This is uh, my secretary, uh, Donna Meyer, in the foreground, and a great potter from Healdsburg, Nancy Morgan, behind her. And you can see they're working at this totally together, and it's pretty exciting. So the first category uh, group of effects are categories that are linked together uh, under the term hero or flame effect. And these are, um, these are the, the effects that come from the volatized material, the material when the chemicals in the wood ash turn gaseous. And um, they're only possible, they only show up when there's just the lightest amount of flame of ash deposit, a very, very light ash deposit. So it happens at quite a distance away from the actual wood burning uh, and the heavy, the heaviest ash deposit will prevent a hero from occurring. So we can look at this example here and um, you can see in this case, the hero is that uh, those two colored bars in the foreground of this piece, in the front of this piece. Everything else that you see on this piece are as a result of uh, the ash deposit. But those two bars of color, the one kind of purplish and the one reddish, those are um, hero effects, those are flame effects. And it's because this part of the piece was very, very close to another piece. 
um, in fact may have s had stuck to it a little bit and that made it um, difficult for the ash to get very far into that area which left it open for Hiro. It's a nice design effect when you're loading. Here we can see some examples of Hiro. So these, all of these pieces you're looking at went in as white clay and you can see all this wonderful uh, undulating flame effect across the surface of, of the piece. So that's Hiro. Here are some other examples. Now this is a different thing. This is called nuke, and nuke are the shapes that are formed by flame marking um, the hiro. And it occur the, the actual shapes take place when the clay is either completely or partially obscured, either by wadding or being very closely um, having the ash uh, uh, obstructed by the piece's placement um, close to another piece. So here are some examples of nuke. These are definitely caused by wadding. Here's another great example, a close-up of a piece uh, wadded. And you can see there are many different kinds of effects. We will talk about um, uh, these uh, spot effects coming up. Um, those are the result of both um, feldspathic rock and uh, some uh, quartz rock. Uh, wedged into the clay. Now when you have a big round nuke, it has a special term. It's called a botomochi, which is actually the word for red rice bean, red bean rice cake. So it's a round nuke, it's a round spot. And here's some examples of some round nuke. These, uh, you'll learn about this technique too. These are the uh, finished result of um, a technique we use in the anagama of the dancing fire wood kiln where on the side step we build with I, like an andiron, a, a grate for um, f to hold pieces and wood up a little bit and let air get underneath them and these are the pieces that make up the grate. Here's another example of a rather beautiful uh, bodomoche. So the next category of effects we're going to look at is what happens when the ash has a lot of impingement, when a lot of ash falls on the pieces. Uh, the Japanese term for, the, for ash effects is shizenyu. So here are some pictures, and on the right is a very heavily uh, a piece that's got so much ash on it that it's melted together and it's dripping. And on the left is um, a very special kind of, uh, of deposit uh, we often refer to as a kind of sesame seed deposit. It's very early on or it's very far away from the, the flame of the kiln that these things occur. So, and on the left there's another kind of effect called tamadari. So we're going to learn about all of these. Here's another example of tamadari. Um, so let's look at these. So the first one we started talking about sesame seeds. So these little golden spots, um, gomabai is the, the Japanese term for the sesame seed. And um, what this is, this is either, um, this is a piece that's a further away and just gets little spots, little, little deposits of ash, little um, sprinklings of dusting of ash uh, on them. And then uh, you can see that example here but usually you see it as separate spots. Now here's a very special uh, gomabai. This was a piece uh, in a firing where the, um, probably a very slow firing, which means we were probably firing greenware, and the pieces, um, uh, the ash at some early stage is floating through in very, very big flakes, and those land undisturbed on the piece and melt in place, and that gives you a very unique gomabai. And then there's tree bark and cantaloupe. So melon hada and anoki hada. Tree bark and cantaloupe skin. So uh, there are two different um, ideas. This is the anoki hada, the tree bark. And this occurs after you've melted the pieces and then they've been allowed to cool a little bit in, during the firing and then you heat them up again. And just before they start to melt again, they get this, this rumpled textured effect, this anoki hada, the tree bark. 
and this is the melanhada. This is uh, actually ash has been deposited and is just beginning to melt on the pieces. And this is that kind of it puckers up and makes this kind of melon skin just before it's about to to melt into a more liquid, glossy surface. And if you stop the firing at this point, then you get the melanhada. Here again is another picture of a nokihada and some melanhada. So pinholes um, on natural ash is called shimi, and spotting on natural ash is han ten. And han ten um, is any kind of spots, and they occur for a number of different reasons, many, many reasons. Like in this case, what you're seeing on the left here is um, uh, embedded feldspathic rock, like the same as decomposed granite, that's melting and turning white and creating spots. Here. Um, here you have the um, same kind of thing and what's happening here is you have an over uh, over the surface you have some melted um, shizenyu some nice ash deposit and then the there were um, feldspathic rock or decomposed granite wedged into the clay and as it melts out because it does melt at these temperatures and become flux it's creating these little spaces these little spots around the holes of the piece creating a kind of Han Ten. And here's another kind of Han Ten, which is crystal growth. Uh, or actually, I think in this case, this is um, crystal growth is one form of Han Ten, and you can see a little bit of that here perhaps, but what you see mostly is uh, carbon trapping in between the crevices of a uh, textured glaze. So Amibai is natural ash webbing, and this is the next step. After you get uh, Gomabai, uh, the sesame seeds, then you get amibai or this kind of spider webbing um, uh, that happens, this webbing that is just before it starts to form into rivulets and drips. And so here you can see some examples of that stage of the amibai and a little bit of hanten. And that's the other thing is that on a piece you'll have many, many different effects on one piece. It won't all be just one but there may be one effect that is predominant. When the amibai begins to coalesce and get more ash and it begins to uh, uh, kind of come together and start to drip, and especially if it has a little ball of natural ash at the end, it's called a tamadare, uh, kind of a kiln tear. Um, and here are some beautiful photographs of examples of tamadari. And these are very cherished um, kind of effects. And some wood fire uh, artists will actually determine, you can see on the left here, the tamadari actually ran down and got to the bottom of the piece. And some wood fire artists will actually look into the kiln as it is firing, and they will um, time the firing so when the, when the drip looks like it's getting closer to the bottom, they'll stop the firing. So a bitero is a kiln teardrop or a tear of joy. And these are typified by being clear, beautiful jade green color. And here's a, some photographs of those. And one way to encourage those without fail is um, uh, having a tripod form like this. You can see if you look closely uh, that there is a, a teardrop at the base of each one of these, a bitero right at the base of, one of the, each one of these uh, teapots. And then there's Yudamari, which is an ash pool. And this is a clear green pool of ash, Yudamari. Mari meaning pool or ocean. And so you can see um, it, it has a clear quality to it. And usually it's green. And these occur um, in our kilns. They tend to occur not on at the very front of the kiln, on the, on the edge of the shelves, it, it won't occur because it'll get so much ash that it kind of gets matted over. But uh, just behind the front, uh, either on the back of the front shelf or the front of the second shelf, you'll get some Udamati effects. Now erosion is a very special uh, effect, uh, uh, Shinshoku, um, and erosion is, uh, can be quite extreme, as you can see in this picture here. And obviously, this piece no longer becomes a functional um, uh, tea bowl. But I did this piece along with uh, several others at the um, 
uh, International Ceramic Research Center in Denmark, and they like these pieces so much they asked to keep them, and they're on display in the, in the shelves in their library. And uh, because it's such a beautiful kind of sculptural quality about this erosion, and it really is a natural form, here's a, a piece uh, that where it started out as an even, fairly thick, uh, not thick, but a even and um, neck and a lip. And after the firing, you can see that it actually ate a hole through the piece and that the, actually, if you were to touch the edge of that, it's razor sharp. And what's actually happening here is there's so much ash hitting these pieces at such high temperature that it melts the clay and drips down the piece. And then it melts the clay and drips down the piece. And it keeps doing that until indeed it eats the piece away, uh, sometimes completely like this. And so um, this can be um, a defect. You can be very disappointed if you have a functional piece and this happens to it. Or it can be a sculptural effect. You can make, I, I often make things that are very, very thick to be put in the zones where this happens. And primarily, this occurs uh, uh, at the very, very front of a kiln where the fire is introduced. So you get a, a mild erosion effects in the dancing fire wood kiln anagama right at the front, and you get very intense kind of uh, uh, clay eating effects like this at the very front, in the fire mouth and just outside the fire mouth of the uh, Rosinante kiln, just in just starting into the wear chamber. So mixed johan is the term for when it's a whole bunch of things. So you can see you have some tamadare, you have some hanten. Um, you have some carbon trapping, you have all kinds of, you have some oxidation and some reduction, you have all kinds of effects. And we actually um, cultivate these kinds of layered effects like this. And one of the ways we can do that is we fire up, uh, say, the anagama chamber in the front of the dancing fire wood kiln, and we'll bring it to temperature and hold it there for maybe even a day, and then we'll side stoke for a day and a half, and we'll let the temperature at the front drop so that the, the effects congeal, and then we'll come back to the front and reheat it up and hold it again, and that will put down a second layering of effects. Um, but the reality is, especially this is like a five foot tall piece, and on a piece like this, the reality is that you're going to get a lot of different effects from Shizen to Hiro, from uh, ash effects to, to um, flame markings across the, the range of the piece. And here again, you see some beautiful matte surfaces with some konge, which is the, uh, the uh, kind of a, sticking of, of embers to the piece. They get very solid and hard. Um, range of color, all kinds of different shizen yu. Uh, um, so, and Johan. So here, there's a, a few stories to tell. One is I was at a conference, and at the time, the editor of um, Lark Publications um, was speaking at this conference. And I spoke to her, I thought, well, you know, they're the people that do the 500 examples of this and the 500 examples of that. And I spoke to her about editing a 500 examples of wood-fired ceramics. And she said, oh, we thought about that. We tried that. We had a call for images. And everything we got in was exactly the same. They were all ground, brown and green pots. And they were all um, looking pretty much identical. Um, and all of them looked like kind of Japanese storage jars. And so um, they abandoned the project. And I realized that what I was experiencing was much like uh, what happens when someone isn't familiar with bird watching. Uh, if you become a bird watcher or you know a bird watcher, you know that the, the variety of color and pattern on birds is just endless and wondrous. But if you don't know much about bird watching, you think most of them are just gray and brown and occasionally there's a blue one. And so it's understanding that subtlety of what's available. Here's a piece that certainly doesn't fit into that concept of gray uh, or red, red, and, I'm sorry, green and brown pots. This is such an amazing orange color along with some hanten and some crawling. It's just a, a stunning piece. So beautiful that I used it um, as the poster piece for a museum exhibition in Potsdam, Germany. Um, just a stunning uh, result from the kiln. Um, 
and some of these this happens uh, actually in a fairly it happens on a chino glazed piece and it happens um, near uh, the exit flues on the back of the anagama chamber and sometimes on the other side just inside of the Naborigama chamber there's a zone there that seems to encourage these kind of bruised orange colors which i really love so this other concept that i talked to you about at the beginning of this uh, sh this um, presentation was the idea of Johan that not only do this, the ceramics change, but we as a community can change. And I like to think that, you know, in order to wood fire a pot, it's kind of the existence of that pot and it needing to be wood fired or us wanting to wood fire it that will cause us to organize an entire community. It's sort of, you know, people say it takes a village to create a pot. Well, I'm thinking it's it takes a pot to create a village. And it's a lot it's that it's kind of it happens both ways. And so what that means for you is you can really be conscious about the way that you work with people around the kiln and you can think about the people you're meeting. You could, every stoking shift, you could make sure you, you never leave without knowing something more about the people you're working with and to really start to appreciate them for their various qualities and to really come away with a, a really deep experience of the firing and of the people you work with. So that's the Johan of the community. And here's a, a great picture to kind of typify that. These are the, the people who built the Dancing Fire Wood Kiln. Um, we did it in a workshop format. Um, I'm sitting at the bottom at the base of the kiln. Um, and then on the top, perched in the center, is my collaborator, the Japanese artist Kusakabe. And all of these are students and artists from the community, and uh, there's also two assistants that Kusakabe brought with him. Here again, I love this image, uh, is a project with a pit firing, which is a very early form of wood firing. And this was done in Dorset, England. Um, this was a project I did of making totems with artists and students. And here we are with something that uh, often happens is you take a picture of people standing in the pit. This was the pit before we, we lit, before we uh, fired these totem pieces. So the other thing that you need to think about is that, that a kiln has so many different kinds of Johan. There are so many zones and so many ranges of effects and a lot of times with inexperience, people think about, oh, I just want that really juicy kind of all glazy, drippy thing, or I want this or I want that. And um, they have really crystal clear ideas, really based on little or no experience. And the reality is that there's remarkably stunning effects available to you if you will just pay attention to them and get to know uh, your pieces as they come out of the kiln rather than expecting them to look like something. So everywhere in the kiln, it's capable of producing beauty. And um, a, a very well-known wood fire artist named Peter Callis, um, who became known in part because for many years, he was the one who fired Peter Volkus's artwork. Peter Volkus being one of the most famous artists in ceramics would do uh, art, he would make pieces uh, in workshops all around the country and indeed around the world and then he would have them sent to Peter Callas. He just shipped the bisque pieces to Peter Callas with the expectation that Peter Callas would fire them for him and he would uh, want Peter to put the work uh, right in the front of the kiln so he would uh, he would absorb all of the immediate heavy 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 ash zones and what Peter said when he was speaking was that it taught him that he had to learn to, in order to have his own career and his own artwork that he could exhibit and sell, he had to learn how to make every part of the kiln count because he wasn't gonna get those easy spots where things got very big and, and, and um, had just filled with effects. So he had to learn to maximize every position in the kiln and that every position was capable of getting the finest results. So he did it by how he loaded, he did it by his firing technique, he would sometimes ma manipulate materials and introduce materials into the fire, um, uh, and then he would do it by, in certain places, he would use slips and stains and glazes uh, because those worked best in those parts of the kiln, and by the clay that he chose. But he learned over the years how to make sure that everything that came out of that kiln was worthy. 
So wadding is something we'll talk about more, um, but there are questions that affect Johan. We, we learned that Bodomochi is a nuke, that, so the nuke is a spot on the surface that may be caused by the wadding mark, um, but if it's round, it's a nuke. So you can already hear a little bit of something that people don't really think that much about, but should really think about, because uh, wadding uh, leaves a definite um, design on your piece if you're lucky and if you well actually it's not so much luck as intention so what shape wad do you make how many wads do you put on something if you use a dry wad or a simde uh, you, you when you put your piece on a dry wad um, it doesn't adhere tightly to the surface so some hero will get in and color the clay but if you use a wet wad it's really tied up against the surface and so that will stay closer to the clay color and then how do you orient uh, the wadding on the pot? So wadding has a number of effects. Here's a case where uh, an, uh, an artist was wanting to get very uh, clear patterns on the, kil on the plate. So he made wads uh, in this kind of, almost looks like little DNA molecules or something. And then those would allow us to stack another plate right on top of that one. Here's an example of these uh, little vases that are fired uh, with a triangle, a square, and a circle. So you can see how it can affect the design. And we can take that further. Here's a circle, a kind of uh, orange segment or moon shape, and then an amorphous kind of amoeba shape on the, on the piece. So, and then numbers. What if you do three, and what if they're in a row, or what if they are um, uh, spread out in a more kind of triangle pattern? These are all kinds of things. Here is the artist Nina Ole, which I will have a presentation on uh, later. And when we were working together, I suggested she make a house-shaped wad on her house-shaped sculpture. So the Japanese say a kiln well loaded is a firing 80% successful, which tells you that loading is definitely a part of, of how a Johan is achieved. So the placement of a piece um, is decorating the piece by its location. Uh, in that, by that, I mean how close is it to the actual wood that's burning? How much ash is it going to get? How hot is it going to get? Um, how far away is it? Is it, is it uh, hidden behind another piece? Will it get a very subtle surface? Is it glazed or not? Uh, that'll affect location. How is it oriented? Do you take a, a vase and have it straight up and down on its base, or do you lay it on its side? Do you put it upside down? Um, did you tumble stack it? Uh, these are all possibilities. And then how close is it to other pieces in kiln furniture? Those will all affect the Johan. Um, and I think what I've come to know over the years is that the greatest aesthetic decisions are made by how you build your kiln. Every kiln um, produces different uh, temperatures and different uh, flows of ash and, uh, and flame. And so every kiln is really the most influential quality um, in determining uh, the yohan of your piece, the uh, firing effects. Now the Japanese often say that it's clay, the first concern is clay, the second concern is clay, and the third concern is clay. And there's a lot of truth to that, especially for traditional Japanese pottery from the six ancient kilns. Because what you learn over time when you visit those sites, you realize that each site has a very specifically designed kiln. And in that case, the kilns developed to be most effective with that clay body. So I guess you could argue that it was the clay that was actually determining the kiln design over uh, several hundred years. Um, so those are um, aspects of the kiln to really think about. So how well insulated is your kiln will determine a great deal about how it fires. What's the strength of your draft? How tall is your chimney? The placement of the side stokes, how many and where are they in the, in the kiln? And um, how many primary air intakes are there versus, uh, and how, can, how well can you control secondary air? And primary and secondary air is something we'll learn when we learn more about firing. So here's an example of that. These are two pieces made from the same clay. They're virtually the same shape. 
and the left piece was fired, they were fired at the same time, one in the front chamber of the dancing fire kiln on your left, and in the back chamber of the dancing fire wood kiln on your right. So you can see quite clearly that kiln design does have a major effect. And this is a really important, we can think about it, we can manipulate things, and we can, we can decide uh, where to put things. This is a piece that you will find in the book as well, and I love this piece very much. And it came, uh, it came about, I was uh, attending a wood fire workshop by a fellow named uh, Jack Troy, who has also written a great book on wood firing. And I really wanted to learn uh, from Jack. I wanted to pick his brain. I wanted to know what he knew and, and learn. So that was my goal. So when I went to the kiln that we were firing, um, which actually was a kiln I helped build with Fred Olson, I dropped the work off and I told Jack, I said, you know, you load my, my work where you think it's right and I will, um, I don't want to inter, you know, I don't want to tell you where to load things. And everybody else, the other participants, there were 12 of us, 11 of them were all over Jack telling him where to put their pieces, uh, how to, how to uh, arrange them, where to everything goes. So my pieces ended up getting kind of shuffled and put in the least desirable places. And there were some other problems with the way that they were loaded, but this piece is unique in that it was put in what no, in a place no one wanted, at the very back of the kiln, which is often the coldest part of the kiln, and um, so people didn't want to be back there. And we couldn't have predicted that there were some, uh, the kiln had started to develop some flaws, and Jack was unable to get to temperature in the front of the kiln, but he was able to get temperature in the back. So this piece came out, and it was the absolute best piece in the entire kiln, and there was no way to predict that this uh, carbon trapping would ever occur, but it did, and, um, and it, I got this gorgeous piece, and so th what that teaches me is that um, you have, when, you, when you're loading, you just leave your expectations and your assumptions out of the kiln. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think, let me, I'm going to zip back here, because I think I might have missed an important little... Um, Let's see if I can find, I may not be able to, but it'll be fun to just see all these things again. Um, where was that? Well, maybe it's coming up. There's a quote by Owen Rye. Well, we're going to see these go by a lot. Okay, so it's coming up. That was fun, though. We're going to see all of those again. This is what you do in really professional presentations. Isn't this something? Okay, here we go. Getting back to where I was. So, there are six stages of firing, and we'll go over this more fully when uh, all of this is very well uh, brought up in the book. So the first stage, uh, up to about 300 degrees, we call a uh, warming or kumuritoshi. And, uh, and it's much like what you do when you're baking bread. It's the raising of the bread dough. And then there's the toasting, which is about 300 to 575 Fahrenheit, aburi. That's a stage two. Stage three is warming to the attack or base camp, a semi aburi. And the semi uh you're getting up to about 1,560 degrees. That's really around bisque temperatures. And um, when you think about, uh, in this metaphor, it's, it's base camp. You're going to climb the mountain peak. So you get and you establish base camp, and you, you rest, and you feed yourself, and you get cleaned up, and you get your equipment ready, and you're ready for the big climb, the attack or the climb, the semi. And um, this is where we're going to get to top temperatures, anywhere from 2320 to 2370. Um, so, and these first four stages, up to this stage, are just like what you would do in a reduction glaze firing. So if you were to stop the firing right now, after you got to this point, um, the glazes would be fully melted and you would have a great firing and it could be if you were doing just glaze that's what I would do but if you're firing for ash effect then you need to keep going 
and that gets us to the fifth stage, the sustaining of high temperature, the nirashi. And this stage is unique because its length is going to determine the quality of effects you end up with. And uh, there's lots of decisions you can make um, where during this stage. And this is where wood firing really becomes wood firing, where it distinguishes itself from other firings. If you visit a kiln that's been, that they fire, uh, a large kiln that's fired for two or three days, uh, rarely gets uh, very much yohen. Um, what you want is something glorious and unexpected, and that occurs in the nirashi. That's uh, in part happening by the nirashi. And so one concern when you're firing in this stage, one concern during the whole firing, but definitely during this, is the speed of the flame. And we regulate that by manipulating what are called passive dampers. In the chimney, we have bricks that we can take out and leave a hole in the chimney, and that will slow the flame down. So this is an example of what something looks like if you do not slow the flame down. And what you see is, you see the ash coming to the, to the silhouette of the piece and then just taking off to the next piece. So you get a very marked line. You get a line down the middle of your piece. And on one side is the ash, and on the other side is the hero. And it's very distinctive, very graphic, this line. But if you slow the kiln down and you fire, um, you slow the flame down. So I often, when I'm firing, I will manipulate the flame and, and slow it down and speed it up. If you're doing that, you will get um, a f uh, the, the, the ash will stay with the piece a little longer, wrap around a little more, and give you a wider range of effects. The final stage is super important. It's the finishing and the cooling, the hidomi and the sa samashi, samashi. And it's one of the most creative and influential parts of the wood fire because uh, your final results are going to be determined by what temperature you were at when you finished, the speed of cooling. If you cool really quickly, you get glossy. If you cool slowly, it tends to be more matte and crystals can develop. And then uh, how much reduction or oxidation? You can do a, a body reduction and cooling cycle. And um, my practice more and more these days is to do a cooling that holds the kiln for a couple of hours at 2270. It allows the kiln, uh, it, that's really this, the, the stage where color will be um, developed in the hero. So you hold it there as you're cooling down and you, you fire down to cool slowly. And then there's the unloading. And with the unloading, it's really important to, uh, to go slow. And what I mean by that is um, you want to discover rather than expect. So you want to discover what you've got rather than expect results. So you abandon all preconceived expectations in favor of carefully observing um, what you've got. Um, I won't go into the lesson of the sword master here. You can ask me about it later. Um, know that the aesthetic is decidedly non-Western. And it may be unfamiliar to you. Uh, the aesthetic of a wood firing is asymmetrical. It, it prefers, uh, it, it, it uh, preferences um, asymmetrical surfaces where, where the, f the fire facing part of a piece is quite different than the, f the part that faces away. So that's not a typical piece of ceramic that's fired, say, with a blue glaze, and it's the same all the way around. Ceramic artwork often has a layer of ash on it, so when you're first unloading, don't make quick assumptions by what you see looking into the kiln, because it, you really can't see it until it gets rinsed off. So we go slower, slower and slower than that. You really have to slow it on down, because learning is everything. We take notes, we observe carefully, and we're trying to learn lessons that will inform us in future firings. Uh, you don't want... Um, all those lessons will be uh, gone after the kiln, as the kiln is unloaded. So you want to really observe and, and contemplate what you're seeing. And this is the quote I was looking for earlier. Sometimes the pots are right and your expectations are wrong. That's Owen Rye, who just uh, published a book about his life. He's an Australian potter. So we'll talk about some special techniques. Uh, this is a, a technique uh, that was practiced quite a bit by Kathy Kearns, and she would take crushed glass, she would make a cavity on the side of her piece, and then we'd have to very carefully make sure we load it at 100% level so that the, the glass would stay in the pool and not run out. 
here's some more examples of that technique. So she had to make these reservoirs for the glass. This is a piece called hikidashi, and this is a technique where we use a glaze made out of one part iron oxide and two parts wood ash, and we glaze the pieces, put them in the kiln, and pull them out at about 800, uh, about cone 8. And then we will uh, either dunk them in water or just set them out to cool. And here's, uh, in, in the Noborigama kiln, we have an actual hikidashi hole. Here you see me looking into it, getting ready to take the pieces out. And here we are actually taking a piece out for hikidashi. So here's another special technique. We like to figure out ways to cook food on the kiln. So here you can see we're doing some sausages and chicken barbecue. I always love it when I have, this is Chris uh, Staley, and Chris is a, a Sarley, Chris Sarley. And, and Chris is a gourmet chef, and he made us some beautiful meals when we fired with Chris. And, you know, food is a thing. Here um, are something that uh, Lauren Bigley called Potter's Cookies. And so she made these, and what they allowed for is you could eat your cookie without getting it dirty because your hands are all filled with wadding mixture or something. So she designed a way for us to enjoy cookies without. Um, so that's a special technique. And then some other very beautiful elements that are possible. Um, and again, this goes, all of this goes to the Johan of community. And you can see this is uh, Michiko Kinoshita, who is a very, very um, wonderful tea person. She presents Japanese tea ceremony, and she's done a few gorgeous tea ceremonies for us uh, around the kiln. And this is earlier days when our kiln actually looked a bit, uh, we, we had uh, a different kind of yard and we had that fence running around along one side of the yard. Here is from the, the building of the kiln, early days, that indeed on the right is Mark Pandone and those two fine officers are part of what we used to, we used to have a police force at Solano College, but that's been eliminated now, it's, we're, we're covered by the sheriffs. But we did uh, tea ceremonies regularly on the side of the kiln as part of the process, and if you showed up, we would prepare tea for you. And every lighting starts with a lighting ceremony, and we'll talk more about that. You'll experience at least two of them, and they're vital uh, for the firing process, and we'll talk more about that. But here are some images. This is actually a taiko uh, drum group that performed for our 10th anniversary. We also had a taiko drum group on our 20th anniversary, and now um, we are approaching our 25th anniversary. I be believe 2023 is our 25th anniversary. And one of the things that happened there was that this, uh, the great teacher and poet Lou Cobain actually performed a poem for that he had written just for the kiln. Uh, these are some of the elements of the tea ceremony, uh, I mean of the lighting ceremony. We do have um, fruit and vegetable offerings. We have flowers for the kiln. We have sake and rice and salt. And then we also, also will do some, uh, some kiln guardians, some little figures. And then we have various uh, ideas, or things that we say during the actual lighting. So some final thoughts. If you had three wishes, of course, one of them would be that you want your work to be beautiful because of the firing. And I'll just show you some pictures of pieces that I think came out beautifully. These are some fire paintings that I do in the kiln. Here's a uh, piece from a series I call The Boats of Nusa Lambangan. And here's a portrait of my wife when she was seven months pregnant with our daughter abstract, of course. So another wish is you want to learn. You want to uh, know more. You want to become better trained for the next firing. And this is an image of uh, the first firing I participated in in Japan. You can see I'm really happy. So if you have three wishes, uh, Ichigo Ichie is an expression um, that comes from tea, and it means this moment, perfect moment like no other. And that goes back to the idea of the yohen of community. 
And of looking at a kiln uh, before it's loaded, you look at a kiln and you see uh, potential. And think of all the times we've fired this kiln and all the people who've gathered around and all the wonderful work that's come out of it. Um, and each time we fire it, each time we prepare to fire, it's always Ichigo Ichie. It's always an expression of the great works of many people. So I'm looking forward to having many great firings with you.